Good evening, and greetings to all of you. It is wonderful to see you all gathered here to welcome you to the 11th TAC faculty lecture. I'm also very pleased that Carl Tack, class of 1978, is with us this evening. Carl, along with his wife Martha, also part of that great class of 1978, generously endowed this lecture series, embracing a fundamental principle, namely, that our intellectual energy as a university comes primarily from the creative work of the faculty as they conduct research and lead students into a deeper understanding and in a quest for new knowledge. So we shouldn't hide our light under a bushel, but rather we should celebrate it and let it shine brightly. And we do so for the 11th time this evening. Carl and Martha also have been very involved with William and Mary, a relationship that extends over several generations. Carl currently is a clinical professor of finance in the Mason School of Business, and he's also the co-director of, Bo of the Bowley Center for Excellence in Undergraduate Finance. And Martha is currently a trustee of the William Mary Foundation. So Carl in vivo and Martha in absentia, thank you very much. Tonight's speaker is Shante D. Hinton, Associate Professor of Biology. Dr. Hinton received her Bachelor of Science from Chapel Hill and her PhD in Cellular and Developmental Biology from Howard University. She conducted her postdoctoral work at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. After teaching for three years at Hampton University, we were able to recruit Dr. Hinton and she joined our faculty in 2010. Six years later, in 2016, she earned tenure as an associate professor, thereby becoming the first minority faculty member in the natural sciences at William & Mary. Dr. Hinton has had an impressive impact in her field and on her students. Her specialty is in cellular and molecular biology, protein biochemistry, and signal transduction. As a research, as, I'm sorry, as a result of her research, she has received funding from the National Science Foundation and has given talks around the globe including in Liverpool, Nassau, Bahamas, and Paris. She has a talent for going to really great places. <laughs> Dr. Hinton's work with students is equally impressive. She has supervised many undergraduate and graduate research projects conducted in her lab. Eight of the nine honor students she has supervised are either in MD or MD PhD programs at some of the country's finest universities, Stanford, Princeton, Northwestern, Cornell, University of Maryland. She has been recognized on campus for her outstanding contributions. Last year, she received both the William Small Award in recognition of her, quote, exceptional teaching ability in the classroom and for her dedication to research in the lab environment. And she was also appointed as the Edward Coco Fellow in Arts and Sciences. Dr. Hinton also received the William Mary NAACP Image Award for consistently being an inspiration to students as a faculty member. Last year, her alma mater, Howard University, celebrated its sesquicentennial, and there she was a recipient of a certificate of excellence in biology, in biology, recognizing her as the most promising scientist that they had produced in the biology department. Now, within the field of biochemistry, Dr. Hinton studies NK sticks. Now, Styx, as you all know, is one of the underworlds, one of the rivers in the underworld in Greek mythology. And so anything dealing with Greek mythology, I think, is pretty cool. So, as the title of the talk said, it's a marvelous night for a brain dance. Shante, come on up. Thank you very much for the introduction. I appreciate it. So thank you. Before I start, I definitely want to thank Provost Michael for that wonderful introduction. And you'll see later that he kind of stole my thunder in the talk, but that's okay, because I can rely on him. Um, and I also want to thank um, the tax. So call I thank you and your wife for actually developing a platform for faculty to actually show you what's happening behind this public Ivy institution with our students. So I think that's very important. So I want to thank you before I forget towards the end of the night. And I also want to thank um, Dr. Jacqueline McLinden and Dr. Jody Allen. They were the ones who actually put together and nominate, well, nominated me and put together my package for this talk so that I could even be selected. 
So I want to thank you. And then, of course, thank all of you for attending. And hopefully, you are going to enjoy yourself. I know I'm going to enjoy myself tonight. So I want you to think about some things. And what I want you to do now is I'm the type of lecturer that we have to engage with, with each other. So you have to communicate with me so I know what's going on. And so for a few moments, what I want you to do is allow yourself to be free. Allow yourself to respond in any way as if you were in your favorite room in your house, whether it's the den, your bedroom, the kitchen, or you're hanging out at your favorite restaurant with friends. So I want you to take a moment, listen to some music, and truly respond to it. Don't, don't, don't act like you're in an auditorium, and don't be still. Just respond to it. All right. <laughs> See, the students understand. you do feel good and nice, right? Yeah. Now, maybe the first part, the classical, that might not have been for you, and it might have been for some of you. 
and maybe the rap. Some of you just detest rap like my dad always did, but my generation formed rap. So you can understand that I'll have an appreciation for rap. But the point is, these songs sent cues to you, and you responded in a certain way. And so just as you respond, sales responds to cues. And they can respond from cues from their neighbors or the outside environment. And sales can jam too. But you have to be very, you have to watch very carefully as these sales jam, because they can move a little bit quicker than you do. <laughs> so you can see the movement. And as I said, they move much quicker than you would move. And so in society, we have many ways for signaling and communication. And this particular way is what of signaling? How, how, how is um, our signaling regulated by this in society? Remember I told you I'm a lecturer that we have to be engaged, meaning you have to talk back to with me, and I know you know what this is. So <laughs> how do we, in our society, regulate signaling? This is one of the ways. What is this? I appreciate that. Thank you. You have beautiful voices, better than mine. So the question is, what signal is transmitted? So what signal is transmitted? Go. Go. Well, with this, what action would you take? <laughs> so it all depends, right? If you are an aggressive driver such as myself, I will look around. I realize I can't beat my chest. All right. If you are an aggressive driver such as myself, I will look to make sure it's safe, but I'm probably going to go. But yelling means that we should yield and stop. But you understand the importance of um, signaling. And so sales have signaling ways as well. And don't worry, there's nothing wrong with your eyesight. I intentionally blurred this because cellular signaling is very complicated. And how do we begin to understand cellular signaling? Is we just look at one particular area, such as this molecule or these molecules, to really think about cellular signaling. And so with that, when we look at a protein, we look at them because they're cellular workers. And so I want you to take a moment to look at this video and choose, there are two videos, and choose which way that you think proteins work within a cell. So these were two videos of William and Mary students, right? One video was when the William and Mary students and faculty and staff, I should add, wrote um, the World Guinness Book of Records. That was years ago. It's been broken again now. But they were more synchronized, you know, dancing like this and shaking together, all in uniform. And then you have the last day of classes where what's going on there with the students? <laughs> you don't know, right? They are just, they're, the seniors are having a ball that this is it, last day of classes, just have two weeks of final, and they graduate. So the question to the audience is, which way do, the cell, do proteins function in the cell? Are proteins moving in the same uniform way, or are they moving well? Well, I, we need to hear you. I can see you, but um, administration, President Taylor, um, Dean Conley, they can see you, so we need to speak up here. So which way do Proteins work in a cell. <laughs> two. <laughs> I like how you just like two. And so if you think about it, you're right, too, that you have proteins hanging off. Look at there, signaling here. So this is the way that proteins actually work in a cell, exactly how students move around during the last day of classes. But you have certain type of um, communications. So I want to take the time to say, look, hopefully we're going to have a marvelous night. It's definitely a marvelous light, night to have a brain dance. So please grab and hold on as I take you through my research program about MK Stick. So I want to introduce you first to the, pseudo, the protein family that MK Stick comes from, talk about the function of MK Stick, and then 
summarize its function and significance and tell you about our ongoing research in the lab. And then, of course, make sure I give the proper acknowledgments. So with that, let's get started. What is this? What do you think about it? Yeah, you all is like, no, I really don't want to deal with this tonight. Well, I say to you, you already know a lot that you don't think about, but you already know a lot about this table. So those of you who are English majors, music majors, see some of my business professors and music professors, they're on the front row like, oh, no. <laughs> I say, but you already really know some things. So what is that element that we're pointing to? All right, what's the next one? And if we put two hydrogen molecules together in an oxygen, what do we have? <laughs> See, look at that, already smart. We went from an element to a compound. Do we like water? Yes. What about this compound? <laughs> why no? What is this compound? And why you said no whether we like it? <laughs> White, fossil fuels. So you're right, it's carbon dioxide, so we have to think about it. So see, you already knew things about the periodic table. So if I introduce it to you again, we can be happier about it. Now my lab <laughs> works with this particular element, phosphorus. And I'm just gonna you, now just say phosphate, and you know a lot about this. Look what all the things it's used for, right? Detergents, fertilizers, pesticides. Now of course, I'm paying attention to this part. Like, this is why I'm interested in phosphorus or um, phosphate. And so the reason why is we have these proteins in the cell here. And so this is a protein. And then if we add this phosphate, and we already know it's an element, so if we add it to a protein, this protein is called phosphorylated. What I want you to pay attention to is when you have a protein that has no phosphate group, then it is a non-phosphorylated protein. We're going to add a phosphate group. Then look at what acid. So kinases, that's a protein. I normally would say an enzyme, but tonight we'll keep it simple. Kinases, this protein kinases, add a phosphate group to a protein and make it phosphorylated. Now once a protein is phosphorylated, we have another set of enzymes or proteins called phosphatases. The phosphatases does what to this phosphate group? It, right, it takes it out, it, it removes it. So it dephosphorylates the protein. So now we're gonna have to learn some things. So what protein adds the phosphate? Kinases, keep it in mind. What protein removes it? Phosphatases, and if we wanna get a little bit more detail, we can actually call these enzymes. And phosphatases, are, enzymes are mostly known because of their function. So a phosphatase, and it has the ACE, removes that phosphate group. So you got that? You're following me? All right, so why is it important to me? Believe it or not, this is my field. These are the people in my field, and you can see me there looking so scared. But these are the people in my field, and it's important. And, and notice this, there are more of you in this room than the people who work on phosphatases. So that is very clear. It's just about 180 of us. Well, what's interesting is this guy here, and now I'm flipping too fast. Okay, this guy here, Nicholas Punk, in 1988, he characterized the first protein tyrosine phosphatase. And this is who I received my training under. So you might say, Shante, we really don't care about a British guy. Why do we care that he characterized the first protein tyrosine phosphatase? And I would say you should care because the very first protein tyrosine phosphatase that he characterized has been implicated in all these various diseases. And exactly, wow. And then more importantly, maybe you're like me, I hate wordy slides. As soon as I see a lot of words, I'm gonna turn my head away from the slide, that this might me bring it to home for you. That okay, what, as scientists, what we have is we work with mice in the lab. Well, I don't have any, any in the lab right now, but a lot of us work with mice in the lab. And I would say to you, imagine if someone fed you a high fat diet. So for the students at Women Mary, that would probably be Chick-fil-A and Cadobas on campus, right? Your high-fat diet. For faculty, it'll be Blue Talon and what's the other restaurant? <laughs> but you understand where I'm, where I'm going with this. Now, which one do you think? So these mice were fed a high-fat diet. And then, do you see a difference in these mice? <laughs> it was like, are you kidding me? What's the difference? One, one is, this, this baby is huge. 
So what do you think is wrong with this mice? It's fat. They don't want, you want to be politically correct. It's fat. So I want to say to you that this mice is the normal mice. Now, this is the lab mice where the first gene that Nick identified, PTP1B, this, that gene was removed from this mice or knocked out. So it was knocked out. It, can't, it wasn't expressed in this mice. So without PTP1B, the mice can be nice, slim, right? But if PTP1B is in this mice, it's fat. And, and so what are the implications? What do you think about this mice? It's fat and what else? When we think about diseases, you see it all the time in commercials and certain news programs. That what do you think we need to be concerned about this mice? Heart disease? Diabetes, right. So we have to think about that, obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. So that's why we really should be paying attention to phosphatases, that it's going to have a huge role in our society. Diabetes, you think about type 1 and type 2, are an epidemic that we have to think about. So with that, I want to point out that just next year, our field will only be 30 years. It will only be 30 years ago that the first PTP1B was characterized by Nick. So keep that in mind as we go through this talk. And for here, these are many other protein tyrosine and phosphatases. So it's more than just the one E characterized, but there are many. And what I want you to pay attention to is, you don't have to know all these phosphatases, but I do want you to know that if you were to see some alphabets with a molecular and cellular biologist and a biochemist, such as myself, called amino acids, if you were to see some amino acids or Keep it simple. Some alphabets in this order where you have H for histidine, C for cysteine, five amino acids in an arginine, or five letters in an arginine. When you see this, this sequence, that is a phosphatase. It is a protein tyrosine phosphatase. It is no denying it, that it is this. So are you following me thus far? All right, you're with me. So with that, try to take a test, <laughs> short quiz. So. You have an insert, and what I want you to do is see do you have a phosphatase, and if you have a phosphatase, put a rectangle around it, and the first four people who, get, who thinks they have it, or whoever is the first four who has it right, we have a gift for you. So raise your hand if you have it. <laughs> I, I kind of want to tell, say, students who are in my class, you're not allowed, but I can't do that. <laughs> Do we have four yet? You have one, so yep. All right, so it's up to the, the, the mic carriers to, to check. Are we ready to check? Do we have four people? OK, one, two, three. All right, so we have four. And so there's the answer. If you circle that or I'm sorry, you put a rectangle around it, then it's correct. So now you know how to look up whether a protein is a protein tyrosine phosphatase. <laughs> so I, I'm going to move on unless you're enjoying yourself for time, but I, I really prefer to move on. <laughs> OK, so thank you for your participation. So with that, you now understand what is a protein tyrosine phosphatase. You know how to look at a sequence and pick out if it is a phosphatase. So now I'm about to ask you, what about if it's a pseudophosphatase? And I know some people are like, I cannot pronounce that word. The word is too big for me. I'm done. And I say, no, let's back it up. What if it's pseudo? What does pseudo mean? False. False. So you already know what a phosphatase does. What does a phosphatase do? It removes the phosphate. So if it's a pseudophosphatase, what does it do? It cannot remove the phosphate. See, you're so smart. So <laughs> it cannot remove the phosphate, as this is showing. But the question is, what does it do? What is its job? And that's what my lab is, um, has to think about, that what is the action of pseudophosphatases? And the reason it's important is because our human genome, there are 10% 
of pseudophosphatases within us. And that was kind of subtle, right? You didn't see where that 10% came up. Did you see the yellow to the blue? Oh, you did? Because oh, I was going to ask about 10% of you to stand up in the room so you can really understand what 10% means. That 10% is a large amount. That, that was, if I were to ask this entire front row to stand up, if, if, and you know, let's do that. Exercise your legs. Some of you are tall. You're not short as me. So all of you, meaning all of you on the floor, let's stand up, not just the front row. So that's like saying, and I'm sorry to the admin, but that's like saying that they are insignificant. They are phony, fake, they just don't exist. We should not pay attention to them. Just because they have pseudo <laughs> in front of their names. And, and President Taylor, President Reveley is like, it's OK. <laughs> but, but OK, thank you for participating. Please have a seat. But the point is, of course, they're not significant, right? You're, not, you're, you're an individual just like the people who are behind you. And so as a scientist, when we look at, especially those who look at pseudoenzymes, we understand that we can't abort pseudoenzymes, that we need to understand them more. And that's the job of my particular lab. And so the question is, what do pseudophosphatases do? And right now, we know that a phosphatase is going to do what? Right? And so pseudophosphatase, yes, it can grab that phosphate, but it can't take it off. So maybe it serves as a dominant negative. And you're probably like, what? In essence, maybe it just serves as a what? A blocker. You know, that maybe it blocks the um, protein tyrosine phosphatase to prevent it from removing the phosphate group. And that's maybe. I'm here to tell you that it does so much more than that, that it's not that boring old just blocker. It can be, but it does so much more than that. And for me, what's been interesting of um, working with the pseudophosphatase is the first pseudophosphatase identified actually have a relevance to Styx. And it was intentionally named after the um, Styx River. And so what do we know about the Styx River? Provost Hollerin, you are not allowed to answer this question, because that is his expertise as a Greek mythologist. So. What do we know about the Great River, or the Styx River? It's in Greece? <laughs> See, this is a historian. He's going to go like, look, it's in Greece, it's real, it's in Greece. And I'm, I want the ones in the Greek mythology, you know, where our imagination and creativity, and I know you have that as well. So it's in Greece. What else? Hades, Hades underworld. So what is in the underworld in Hades? But what else? What about dead, pe dead people? <laughs> and see, now she's going back to the, her, the historian way. And she's right. You have the, the, the sticks, the red, um, you, Euphrates. Help us out, historian. But also, isn't it Greek mythology that it allows for immortality? Ah. Maybe I should have had you help me, Michael. <laughs> that, yeah, you, we have a beautiful story, right? What do you know about Achilles Hill? So Achilles Hills, right? So Achilles. Achilles was born just like us, but his mother wanted him to have, what, to be immortal, live forever. So she dipped him in. She held him up and dipped him in the, the um, Styx River. But because she was holding him, what didn't the river touch? His heel. His heel. So every part of Achilles was immortal. And how did Achilles die? An arrow shot him in a hill. And so now when we have pain, or we'll go what? A weakness. I would say not pain, but weakness. We go Achilles' heel. So that's the rel relevance of pseudophosphatases having a role, um, having relevance to Greek mythology. That was great for me because I love reading Greek mythology as a child. And so the second um, phosphatase that was identified was MK Styx. And so Styx was the first, and my lab focused on MK Styx. And so this, this um, protein has two domains, your dual specificity domain. Well, I'm just going to say the phosphatase domain. And you already know the sequence for the phosphatase domain. But notice, what's different for MK Styx? Do we see this histidine? Cysteine? Yay, no. 
Thank you. No. So that lets us know that this is a pseudophosphatase. It doesn't have that sequence that allows it to be uh, protein tyrosine phosphatase. And this particular domain here, this is as a docking domain. And now we live, where well, some of us actually live on the peninsula, or with Williamsburg is near the peninsula, so we understand what's docking. What's the role of docking? Right, coming into port. So basically, sorry, basically a protein able to come and dock here. You know that this is the docking domain. So certain proteins are able to bind this particular part of MK states by coming, docking, and as Hermine uh, said, coming into port. So that's the, and it's my lab's job to figure out what's the role. So just to slow it down to recap, this is a phosphatase, so it's going to do what? I know you're tired of it now. The other sequence prevents it. And so, and then it has relevance to the river of the dead. And so my overarching question is, what is the function of MK stits? And believe it or not, what gave us the, fun the function of MK stits is stress. Now, my mother is probably stressed figuring out what is my child going to say? I'll behave tonight. But I know Steve was stressed yesterday when he didn't see me until 30 minutes later. <laughs> but what happens if you're stressed? What happens to you if you're stressed? Blood pressure rises. What else? Heart rate. Heart rate. Can you function properly? No. And basically, cells do the same thing. When a cell is stressed, so let's start with a normal cell. Normally, a cell has this system. We're familiar with DNA. So it has this system where it can replicate the DNA. The DNA is transcribed to RNA. The messenger RNA is translated to protein. So when the cell is on a normal day, when everything is fine with the cell, you have this messenger RNA translated to protein. But when it's a stressful day for that cell, what happens? This, this messenger RNA is stalled, and they aggregate together, and it forms what we call these stress granules. So when the cell is stressed, it has a protection mechanism and it forms these stress granules. And so that is what I'm about to show you, that if you look at this picture, and we're looking at the top, because the bottom are all nice controlled cells. This is just cells, the nucleus and the cytoplasm. But if we incorporate a protein called G3BP, that it can stress the cell. If we put this cell, G3BP, this protein in this cell, G3BP, it stresses the cells and causes those stress granules that aggregation of messenger RNA. So do you see that this is a small green dot here? And then this large globulars, because that's where a lot of them accumulated. Can you tell that? Right. And I should say that this is a green fluorescent protein. Um, protein, we just tag proteins with the green fluorescent protein that um, we take from jellyfish. So we just tag them so we can visualize them in cell. Now, you can see that this is a globular. And the presence of MK stits, do they look the same? What does it look like? It's broken. It's smaller. Man, you all are already scientists. You don't need me to stand in front of you, right? So what's interesting is, what's beautiful is that even if we put MK stits in a different set of cells, and now I'm showing you a different set of cells, you still see these granules, right? Here, here. Now, of course, this panel is MK stits. What do you expect to see in this panel? Granules or no granules? Exactly, no granules. And so you don't see any granules. MK stits decreases stress granules in HeLa cells. Now, I need to take a moment to talk to you about HeLa cells because 66 years ago, Henrietta Lacks died exactly this day, 66 years ago, with cervical cancer. And the reason we're able to even do research as science and um, produce drugs for um, medicine is because she had, sorry, she had, she had an immortal cell line. That the cells that the um, doctors at John Hopkins obtained from her cervix were actually able to grow. They're still growing in some professors' labs, such as mine and Dr. Allison's lab to this day. We're still utilizing her cell to push research and medicine forward. So I wanted to make sure that we understood where these cells actually came from from that we're still using today. And it was amazing to realize that it's actually exactly 66 years ago that she passed away, but her cells from her service 
are still growing and we're utilizing them in science today. And Oprah did um, make a movie about this um, earlier this year. And so for my lab, it's been very helpful because it allowed me to create a model for um, stress grounds. And basically, this is showing that MK stits decreases stress grounds no matter what situation that we um, cause the stress granules, the MK stits actually inhibits it and de decreases it. Therefore, we call MK stits its toothless regulator. So this pseudophosphatase is able to be a regulator. Why is it significant is this was the first report on MK stits as the functionality of MK stits. So we were the first to report this, that this pseudophosphatase actually has a function and it's that it decreases stress grounds. And then the second report, as you can see, are with undergraduates, Elizabeth from Hampton, and then Michelle and Jamie are women, Mary undergraduates. And so they are able, and they're, notice Jamie is the first author, not me at all, that we're producing these, this data is with undergraduates who are the leading authors in their own field, because we're leading the way. So at the time that we published this paper, it was also stated that G3BP, that protein that causes stress granules, also has a role in neuronal development. So what do we mean by neuronal development? So think about a neuron. This is a neuron. And we have the cell body here. We have the axon there. And then we have the dendrites. Now, what do you notice the difference? This is a cell body. This is an axon. What are the differences between the axon and the dendrites? Branching, right? So the axon is just this long extension of the cell. And then you have these dendrites where you can see branching. So that's your distinct difference. You know that now. So one of the questions was, does MK stits has a role in neuronal development? But we didn't use neurons. What we used were adrenal medulla cells. And basically what we're saying is we use cells from a rat that came slightly above from the kidney, and that's what we use as a model. The reason why, as you see here, that PC12 cells, actually they're, they're in the lab, they're, they're, they are these boring cells. They're just round, boring cells. But if you add a stimulus such as nerve growth factor, they become these cells with, ex with extensions. And let me go back, with extensions here. So they actually have these extensions, but if we add a different stimuli, you don't see the extensions. So with the nerve growth factor, you actually see these particular extensions. And so that's the reason my lab used these cells, because you can tell the difference between a stimuli that will form these extensions that we call neurites. So with that, the question was, does MK stits induces neurites or differentiation? So I'm going to show you. These are the normal cells here, nice and round, so I might have that. If we add MK stits, what happened? So, so then what's the answer to the question? Exactly, MK stits does induce these outgrowths. And so, and this is just showing that it is MK stits alone that induces outgrowths. So with that, I want us to pause a minute. And it is Halloween. So, well, near Halloween. So you think about everyone want to make costumes, skeleton, different things. But most importantly, you think about, you understand how our skeleton system serves as the framework for who we are and support, right? Where cells also have a system, that's the cytoskeleton system that is required for cellular support. And so let's actually take a closer look at that. We have here the nucleus. We have tubulin in green and actin in red. So you have all these different molecules. We understand nucleus to round. That's where your DNA is. You have your microtubular, which is a cytoskeleton protein in green, and you have the actin. So you, you get that, right? And this is important. These are important in neuronal development. So with this, we now have what we call our growth cones. So the green is what? And the red is? Right. So you have the green is the tubulin, the red is the actin. Then look at how the tubulin is long, and then you have the red actin filaments here. And this is, this is called a growth cone. And so this is where you have the start of those extensions growing. This is required for those extensions. So with me saying that, look at MK stents. You can actually see we have the microtubulars and then the actin. And this is basically, and do you see that? That we have this green and then the red 
It looks more distinct than in the normal cells, but in the present MK stits. And so this is to show quantitatively that MK stits increases the growth cones. So we know that MK stits is increasing growth cones in PC12 cells. The question is, we want to know how. So we discussed that PC12 cells differentiate or have these extensions. And if I give you an external stimuli, what external stimuli, where it's two now, that actually causes the PC12 cells from to be round to go to the extensions? What is terminal stimuli? Right, nerve growth factor, MK sticks, and I'm about to put another molecule in the equation. Also, rho A is a molecule in the inactivation of that. So I want you to pay attention, because you knew NGF, MK sticks, but let's pay attention to this rho inactivation. Now we understand, you have it in your mind, rho A inactivation causes extensions. Are we all on the same page with this? All right, no? <laughs> you will talk to me later and we'll catch up. All right, so with that, which one of these represents rho A inactivation? The top, and I made it easy to you. Red means stop, right? And you would be correct. So when rho A is inactivated, we have extensions. When it's active, it stays round. And so rho A is important because this is a molecule that actually helps with um, reorganization of the cytoskeleton of those tubulin, well, the actin, really, the actin molecules. So with that, when we put MK sticks in, and people say, if you see space between the two, we see space so we know it's great. But I'll take it a little further. This is a normal control where we see rho A is higher, but when we put MK sticks in, rho A is decreased, right? So MK stits is actually inactivating rho A, which says it have a role in rho A signaling. So you might think, what is rho A? Well, how did you get here tonight? Some of you took 60, some of you took route um, 199, Interstate 64. I don't know if my mom them came, Interstate 95, but you took a certain route to get here. And most of you took a route that you were comfortable with that you knew. For me, it depends on what the traffic is like of what I'm going to take to go in and out of Hampton to Williamsburg, because so, it doesn't matter to me. So I'm like not specific at all. But I want to bring this up is let's imagine that, well, not imagine, cells have certain pathways that they have to follow too. And a particular row A pathway will determine these particular outgrowths. So let's make it more. Uh, back to the cellular point, that yes, this is a route, but from the cellular perspective, what has to happen? Rho, so Rho has to activate ROC, a molecule called ROC, which has to activate limb kinase, and this is a kinase, so I can ask you another question. What does limb do? Because this is a kinase. Add a phosphate, right. And then this limb kinase then activates coflin, and the question is, what happens? So as you see here, what's this? This is our nice phosphate again. And you told me to add some phosphate. Now I want you to pay attention to this. And this is important, because I, I am a biochemist, so I can't just leave here and only have you see beautiful pictures and not see bands that we become excited about. Sorry, Jeff. That we become excited about. But notice, we have coflin. There's no phosphate, so it's unphosphorylated. We have coflin with a phosphate. So coflin actually um, regulates actin. Remember that? This is actin again. So when coflin doesn't have that phosphate group, what's happened to actin? It chops it up, right? And so I want you to imagine as we think about Halloween, and you think about whether you're going to purchase a costume or make a costume. I say make your child a costume. They might win the award. Um, and I know my mom remember when I won, when we finally made the costume and not buy it. But when you go and purchase a cloth, you cut it up, right? And then you put it back together for the costume. So imagine that. Well, for actin, at the beginning, actin will be chopped up when coping is not phosphorylated so that it can be reorganized the way it needs to be so that then when coughlin is phosphorylated, this actin then now can be stacked and stable. And why would it need to be long like this? 
because of the extensions, right? You're thinking about the extensions popping out. So keep this in mind now. When you see no ban, then this means acting is being severed, so you, it can be arranged any way it needs to be. But when you see a ban here, that acting is stable, and we think about the extensions. So just to focus on this, MK sits at zero minutes, where the cells aren't told to become no rights or to form extensions. You don't see any ban. And believe me, as biochemists, we get really excited whether we see ban and then no ban and ban or ban and it's decreasing. We're very excited. We have bans. And you can talk to some graduate students and undergraduates. They'll tell you this is exciting to us. But at zero minutes, you see no bans, so no phosphorylation. So what does that mean about coflin? What is or, or actin, really? It means that actin is being rearranged, that it can be rearranged. And then here, that now it can be stacked. And so then, what is it saying? That MK sticks when there's um, decreases um, coflin phosphorylation at zero minutes, so actin can be rearranged. And then at 24 hours, it is increasing it. So now we have this stability where you see these neurites. And so um, that's the basis of that. What's interesting is I'm not a neuroscientist. I am a cellular, molecular, um, and development. Well, really, cellular and molecular in my last training in biochemistry. So if there is someone who's a neuroscientist in the room, they will tell you, but what does that matter? Those are just cells from the, above the kidney of a rat. They're not neurons. They're not primary neurons. So what do they mean? That these cells didn't come, uh, that these cells didn't come from the brain. That what, the, the question is, what happens if we took the brain of a rat or a mice and looked at the neurons, what does MK stits do? So does MK stits have an effect? And this is what you can see. So let's go back now. Here, this is, remember, this is a neuron. This is a neuron taken from a rat's brain. What is this? Yeah, but you know the specific name of the extension. Thank you, axon. And what are these? Dentrites. And this is normal. What happened in the presence of the MK sticks? It shrink. Can you tell what's an axon or a dentrite? No. <laughs> to me, this is exciting that this made a difference. Like, this is really exciting that we had this normal axon. You put MK sticks in the present. Um, some of you said shrunk. What else do you see differently? We can't distinguish the axon and dentrite. What else do you see differently? Right. These were the pits, which are dead cells. So in MK sticks might be increasing um, death, which we call ap 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 I can't pronounce it, apoptosis, apoptosis, that's funny, apoptosis. But that, that is what, you know, things that we see. But you can see that definitely it's having an effect. And so if we look a little further, if we start and see this is the um, neuron again, axon dentrites, and you have other axons bonding, if we actually look here, we have dentrite there in the axons that it call what we, it forms what we call a synapsis. And the synapsis is important for carrying information from one neuron to another neuron or another cell. So let's take a closer look that with this dentrite here, that these dentrite has these other molecules here, these circular molecules or parts of it that are important for carrying this information. So I want you to look at that, that you have this dentrite or here, and then you have what we call the spine. What does it look like is happening in the presence of MK sticks? Right, it's longer. And so this work has been so important that it has led to this um, publication with your green button is really all right, killing me right now. That <laughs> it led to this work. Ah, sorry, bear with me here. It led to this work. I'll get it. It led to this work with five undergraduates, and my master's students would tell you she's my favorite master's student because she's my only master's student. <laughs> 
for now, for now. But it led to work of all of these are, and I um, pasted them in the order of their, of their status of the publication. So it led to this publication. We were the first to publish that, that MK states a pseudophosphatase have a role in neuronal development. And then it led to this paper, and you don't see the student, because if Arya, you can step up here with me, because she's here tonight. This is who I call my mini-me, and that's because Arya, <laughs> Arya, well, I can't at least give you a hug. So I'll say this is because Arya reminds me so much of myself when I was her age, her personality, her zest, everything about Arya, except she's so much brighter, so much better looking. Reminds me of Arya when I was her, her age. And I, I miss you dearly, actually, <laughs> in the lab. But this is Arya's, thank you, Arya. So this is her publication, this first, um, this is, her this is her publication as first co-author. And notice she's the only, it's just me and her. So Arya actually did this work, for, this figure for this paper while I was in Toronto. And we would call, um, talk on the phone, you know, at least three times a week. But she got the work done. And so this paper was published. So thank you so much, Arya. And also, the next publication, Arya is also on. But we now have another um, new student from chemistry, Christina. And you can see some of the same players. Christina, who's also on this work, that's due, you can see this month, hopefully I'm going to have it in by next week, but that, that's what I showed you have led to all of this work. And so the question is, why should society care? Or really, why should you care? And the truth is, you should care because from the very beginning, we already have um, our genes and certain proteins that may be very relevant in as we age, and it's still a puzzle to us. So we have to go back and really figure this out because what happens in early development is a puzzle. How do we get here? So we definitely should care. And for me, it became very personal, right? Because these are my maternal grandparents, and they helped my parents raise me. And each one of them passed away from one of those diseases on the list that you saw in the beginning. But what was really quite... Um, interesting is this is the day I received my PhD and this is granddad and in order to stimulate him that day because he was just sitting down I decided to jump in his lap like I used to do as a child just to get a response from him because he um, at the time he had Alzheimer's and he actually lived eight years from this picture let me see what year was it yeah about eight years later after this picture is when he passed and um, right before I became faculty I went home with my mom to help um, with the care of him. And what we used to do sometimes, because if you've ever been around someone who has Alzheimer's, sometimes it's like they're not there. And it was like, I want him to remember every part of his life. So what we used to do is play his favorite song. Ain't no smiling faces, you know. I mean, the staples can sing, right? So, so this was his favorite song, and it will always get a response, and he will always stop and look up and pay attention and, pay attention and smile. And so, of course, you know music is used as, as therapy for many things, and music is used for therapy for Alzheimer's. Scientifically, I think we're still trying to figure out the if and what other molecular mechanism, how these certain type of um, neurons might be stimulated. But it's something for us to really think about. I don't do that research, but it's something to think about. And you know, even if it's not Alzheimer's, you have to realize we all have a brain. And we all might be confused some days. And we all might <laughs> you know, be like, look, I'm delusional right now. If I don't eat, I'm definitely delusional. But you, you get the point that this is actually important, because all of us may be in, impacted. And when we think about these things, you have to think about um, there could be a mutation in cellular signaling that might, doesn't mean it will lead to these diseases, that might lead to these particular diseases. And then you think about the potential for um, therapeutics, and that therapeutics, and that's important because many, millions of lives are impacted. 
you know, by certain neurological disorders. So just to take a moment, we're almost in in about our ongoing studies. If you would take your pipe cleaners and shape it in the shape of a music note for me, please. <laughs> and you can do it however way you want. You can take them loose, or you can leave them um, wind together as a troop, it looks like, I guess, a triple helix like a collagen. <laughs> Dr. McLendon's looks good. So we have this music low. No, actually, you did a very impressive job. Now, making an ass son. <laughs> it's funny, some of you are like, my music note is too gorgeous to change into an ass son. <laughs> And you're like, no. <laughs> so, what has, so what has to happen to making an at sun? You have to straighten it out. What else? So you have to straighten it out, split it. But you have to do reorganize it, right? So you have to reorganize it. And the reason I wanted you to do that is because you have to think about what a cell has to do with certain proteins, cytoskeleton proteins. They have to reorganize and, and shape to form these neurites and extensions in various other parts of it in a cell. And right now, what my lab is looking at, if you look at the first sticks that pseudophosphatase that was identified, there, these are proteins on the side, They're, and these circles represent interaction. There are certain proteins that only interact with sticks. And notice there are certain proteins that only interact with MK sticks, right? Well, guess what these proteins are? These proteins are actually cytoskeleton proteins. So my lab now is trying to identify the interaction of MK sticks with these particular proteins that only MK sticks interact with. And then the other ongoing project in the lab actually has to do with CRISPR. And if you are paying attention to Jennifer um, Lopez, she actually has, she should have had a pallet NBC movie named CRISPR of gene editing. That was the newest and hottest thing um, in the scientific field. We actually thought that some scientists would probably win the Nobel Prize for it sometime this week. But basically, it said, what do we do if we delete MK sticks? We've been putting MK sticks in the system, but what if we delete it? So with that, um, these, remember, stress granules? MK sticks does what to stress granules? Right, removes them. So if we take MK sticks out of the equation, in the presence of G3BP, should we see stress granules? There you go. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> there they are, the granules. So now we're working with CRISPR, CRISPR tools in the lab to actually figure out what we, um, what's going on with MK sticks. So with that, I want you to just take a moment to see that this work on um, MK sticks really just started in 1998, and look how far we have come. But most importantly, from my perspective, look who's leading the field. It's William and Mary. Therefore, it's your community. And what's interesting, understand that this is William and Mary. These are undergraduates against places like Cold Spring Harbor, um, Van Elden, that's in Michigan, these are major research institutions, and even in Belgium and all the different places. So I would say William & Mary definitely should give itself an applause because we are actually leading the field in this particular thing. And so, and with that, I want you to think about this. This is research, right? I, showed it to you, well, I tried to show it to you without this clicker going back and forth for me flawlessly, but it appears that everything works so perfectly. No, it's a winding road. And then you think you're there, then <laughs> you realize you're not there. And then finally you're there enough to publish, and everybody celebrates science is great, right? And hopefully you have had fun with me tonight, and you've been patient, but it is fun, and we should be more engaged. A scientist isn't the only person that has to appreciate science. You can appreciate science, and hopefully I have done that for you tonight. So also, I want you to think about change. So change also is this winding road, and we get there. And then we go back and we get there. And just because we have this star, we're not there. We're still going. And the reason I want us to think about change is because 
We are at a moment right now at the College of William and Mary, or William and Mary as we want to say, we are at a moment at William and Mary where we can, ce can celebrate some things. And so one of the things we need to think about is we have two historical moments at this institution that we really need to start paying attention to. Next year will be the 100-year celebration where 24 women walked on this campus and made it a co-educational campus. So that's... <laughs> and so that's 2018 and 2019, but currently, we need to celebrate right now the 50th anniversary. <laughs> and actually, the ladies are here where we have desegregation of the campus. And so we have Lynn Brawley. He could just stand up. <laughs> we have Janet Brown Stryford. And then we have Karen Eli, who graduated from biology, the department that I'm in. <laughs> and so I say this because these ladies are very humble. You know, they are pioneers, and I understand them, you know, being humble, the humility um, that pioneers have. But I do appreciate William and Mary for standing up and celebrating your pioneers, I think is very important. And I know that you say that you were just doing the right thing and coming to school, you were going to school. I say to you that it's more than that. It is a 50-year legacy that because you were bold enough to go to school and be a pioneer and be the only person that I'm able to stand here today and show you your legacy, that if you weren't here 50 years ago, I'm not here. So I hope you truly understand that and why we want to celebrate you. And with that, as I begin to end this talk and show you all my students, they understand they are my legacy, therefore they are your legacy. And I say that to you because people think I'm young. And as you see from this picture behind me, I'm not that young. I already have students who are hosting each other, let me stand out of your way, who are hosting each other at PhD programs. And then if you look at these students here, look at the diversity of these students who were in my lab um, this last academic year. And I can tell you, it is a challenge, but the most amazing award to work with a diverse of students, because you have to learn to respect each other's cultures. So it's been, you know, and I, I'm sure they still keep in contact with each other to this day. And then this doesn't even represent the number of students who I have trained at the College of William and Mary, which is still your legacy. And this is just six years we're talking about, because I've been holding off lately. But this is just six years, right? And then they graduate, <laughs> as you can see, and the process begins again. So now I'm going to introduce my new bunch here. Andy Matai, if you could at least stand up, come to the front. Ine, Ben. Kirsten, <laughs> Ashley, Greta. So, so as you can, and so these, and, and they have been a lovely, and they are a lovely crew. So as you can see, your legacy continues. So 50 years ago, that, that was very important. You know, just like, as I said, that when Henrietta Lacks died 66 years ago, of course her family didn't want her to pass, but it's very important. So. I say to you ladies, I appreciate you, and thank you so much. You can sit back down. I appreciate it. I, I, I appreciate you, and thank you. And so with that, I need to acknowledge um, there are many people to acknowledge, but I definitely want to acknowledge Liz Allison because she was the one who recruited me here in the biology department because they were the ones who were willing to make that change, and so here we are now. So I do thank you, and I appreciate you. And I know that we're going to always have many struggles and changes because that's how we grow, but we'll do it together. And then I want you to pay attention to this list here. Notice my major funding ended in 14. And so and my lab has not slowed down. And the reason why is because of private donations or private funding and these donors. These are very important to us as researchers. <laughs> Thank you.
And the reason why is because you have to understand, 20 years ago, or really just 15 years ago, so the young one of us, we waited too late to become scientists, Funding was at 33%, and now it's at 12%. So you understand the challenges that we have, but we keep doing this because we love this. And I mean, to introduce students to science is one of the most amazing experiences, and that's why I can stand up here and smile and be happy. And with that, I would say I open the floor for questions. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how many different proteins are there in what? In human cells. In human cells. <laughs> <laughs> that is quite an interesting question. And give a direct number, because when I think about, you know, all the different types of cells, so I can't give, you, give the person a, a direct number of like how many different proteins. I can talk about the genome that we, you know, how many different genes we have, but proteins in itself, I, I can't say, oh, there are a thousand or so proteins. I can't say that. So I don't, yeah, that's my answer to that. Because cells, cells vary, right? You have different cell types, and you have different type of proteins expressed in these different cells. Yeah, that's Out funny. Of all the things you could have done, why did you become a scientist, and how did protein suck you in? So <laughs> did everyone hear that question? Of all the things I could have done, and if I weren't doing this, my mom and I would have a home interior um, business together, and it would be a household name. So. Um, <laughs> what made me do this is my grandfather talking to me about evolution of snakes and um, saying how snakes um, used to have legs and different things, just fascinated me with that when we were working in the garden or just sitting out on the back um, steps or the front porch. So I just stayed with it. And I was very good at math, actually, but I couldn't, as a first generation, generational student, I couldn't tell my dad. Therefore, um, he was fine with chemistry. Well, my family was fine with chemistry because chemistry we had Abbott's laboratory. So I started out as a chemistry major because the idea was I would graduate in four years and then I, they knew I would have a job. So um, that's how I ended up here. I ended up really just liking science because math was my first love. And so now I'm here. But yeah, and, and to have the opportunity to train undergraduates to do research because they, Doing what you learn in a textbook or in a teaching lab, that is not independent research. And that's fun to, to have that opportunity to train them. And as you can see, they're going off to places and going to do much um, better science than I am doing. So to me, that's a great legacy to have. Yeah, thanks for the question. Any other questions? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was I was fortunate though. I, I really have had great teachers from K through twelve and a great organic chemistry professor at Chapel Hill, Dr. Evans. I mean, I, I just have been very fortunate with that. But thank you. Yes. And the fat rat, is there some type of application in the future to turn that into a pill? I'm not being funny. <laughs> so, but. so what has happened? Um, so to answer your question, they, um, Michelle Trimley, the scientists are still working on it. What that led to is actually that rat led to the studies for the drug for breast cancer that's out now. And what that means is 
the, with obesity is, is much more complicated than what they thought it would be. And so we don't have the correct system yet. We think with the breast cancer studies that we can use what we learned from, from that to then go back and look at obesity and insulin regulation, because it's about insulin regulation. So they are still working on it. And it just led to the drug for breast cancer. But it's something that we're still working on, it. well, they are, and teasing out. So they, they honestly, they think that eventually it probably will need, lead to a Nobel Prize in this field of insulin regulation. Thank you for the question. Yes. So if I could have an unlimited amount of money, I would want us to bring in um, high-throughput high throughput technology here where we actually have, and this doesn't mean it's going to replace humans, by the way, that we actually have robotic machines that we can test like 1,000 genes at a time, that it wouldn't take us 30 years or so now, it was 27 years at a time, 27 years to figure out how to um, make or make a drug to inhibit these enzymes. So that's what I would want to do. I, of course, I would go ahead and get my knockout mice for MK steps. That would be the first thing I would go ahead. I wouldn't do it myself. We would, we would pay a company to purchase that baby and then see what it does. So that would be the first thing. But if I had unlimited, that would be the type of thing so that eventually we at Women Mary can also think about drug ther therapy. I mean, I think we're doing a great job with basic research, you know, and I, we are doing our best to make sure that we stay mainstream. You know, you, you and all our labs, we're doing a great job to stay mainstream because understand, we are working with undergraduates, and these labs are working with people, mostly people who have their PhDs. So we are hanging in there with them. But that's what I would do. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. They always give you these weird questions. We have another question from one of our online viewers. Hopefully I can answer it. <laughs> <laughs> October is Rett Syndrome Awareness Month. Have you applied any of your MK6 research to neuronal development in Rett Syndrome patients? So I have not, and the reason why is that I'm still trying to find out the mechanism to determine what MK, MK Stitz is doing so that I could make a stronger grant with that foundation, but I, I have not, yeah. And also October is, and I should say this, Breast Cancer Month, and so you see that I have on pink, and so my mother is a breast cancer survivor. And any of you who are a breast cancer survivor, if you want to take a stand so we can give her a round of applause. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so. so yeah. So, so I just realized that. And it's Pink Power Day today, too, so breast cancer. But no, I have not. But um, I haven't made MK stits applicable to any disease yet because I still need to tease out the basic research before I go there. Yeah. Yes. Does your work just stop? I mean, we have the axon, we have the dendrite, but does your work stop at the synapse? Or do you go into that space? So that's what, um, that's what I have written a grant on to try to figure out what goes from the synapse? Like, what would happen from there? Does it affect the neurotransmitters? Those types of things. That's what would be my next step. And this, I just showed the neuronal work because it's a beautiful story. But I mean, it's in urine sarcoma, pediatric cancer. There's many other things that my lab is doing too. This is just a beautiful, nice story that people tend to like. So that's why I showed that. But I'm tr looking into. Do we, is MK stits um, enhancing neurotransmitters or different things like that or play a role in that? Yes. Yeah, I'm in a professor Edward Stitz uh, rotation of multiple biology class, and we recently learned that Alzheimer's is caused by the atomic basis of signaling molecules. Mm -hmm.
So um, I personally think that MK cysts is going to have a role in Parkinson or ALS or frontal temporal lobe dementia more so, more so than Alzheimer's. The linking factor would be alpha synecdoline, the protein that um, where you definitely think about dementia. I think that might be the linking um, part of it. So. Of course, Alzheimer's is easier to say because that's what people know the best. But I think what's interesting about Alzheimer's is that we thought it used to just be neuronal, the, the, the loss of neurons. And as you just said, now we have to think about the synapses and how they're firing and functioning. So it might have a role in that. And then that goes back to his question about do we know anything beyond the synapses? And right now my lab doesn't. That's why I'm trying to hopefully <laughs> obtain more money to know about that. of um, schizophrenia. I haven't thought about it, but I'm, I'm trying to think about it right now. I haven't thought about it. Oh, yeah, that um, for PTP1B, that it had a role in schizophrenia. For that one, what it just says is that if PTP1B um, doesn't function properly, doesn't remove the phosphate group, so it's in patients. So basically what it was is people who have schizophrenia, they did a genetic analysis and saw that PTP1B was mutated. But beyond that, we don't know anything else. So that basically, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry it was long, but nice oh, thank you. Thank you, Shante, for a most interactive, informative, and lively um, Lively talk. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, and like uh, Jackie McLennan, I wish I had had a biology or chemistry teacher like you years ago. I wouldn't have known about the river sticks then, only about MK sticks. Um, thank you all. If you go up the stairs uh, and open the doors, you will find a reception waiting for you. I hope the conversation will continue. Again, thank you, Shantae. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>